What's up, amigos? It's the Prodigy Maker Show, episode 47, coming to you live from the Chris Lewitt Tennis Academy. That's my tennis, t- tennis academy. I'm Chris Lewitt. Glad to be here with you guys. I'm excited to share with you a new, new article that I've been writing, working on for New York Tennis Magazine. It'll be published next month. And it's all about playing up. And the title of the article is, Should My Kid Play Up? But it could be helpful for adults or, or, or coaches to understand the different dynamics here. But the articles focus on, of course, junior development because that is my area of expertise. That's my forte. And I wanted to share with you guys some of the thoughts from the article. The article's almost finished, and I will be sending it into the publisher soon. But let's go through it, some of the ideas. And if you have any questions about your own kid or for yourself or any question relating to any broader question relating to junior development and how to train, training protocols, training methodologies, let me know. But this is a very common question. Should I play my son or daughter against higher age divisions and in higher level tournaments? Uh, whether that's at the USCA level, the UTR level, or the ITF level. And also in practice, it's a very common question that I get in practice. And I see parents of many different stripes. I work with a lot of very intense and demanding parents who want the best for their kid. Some of my students want to play on the Pro Tour. Some of my students, most of my students want to play college, somewhere in college. And I have many, many competitive junior kids who I try to shepherd on this journey. So this is a very common question and it's, it's, I think it's a hot debate in the coaching and junior tennis community because I, I believe there's more than one way to do it. I think there's more than one pathway to the top, but let's sort of dig into it and talk about what the different philosophies are and the different approaches are. So in my article, I talked about there's two camps, two, two philosophies on opposite spectrums. And I meet parents who are usually in one camp or the other. And the first camp is basically you must earn your way to get to the next level type people. And for those parents, and maybe the players too, but particularly let's talk about parents because we're talking about junior development. Those parents believe, and coaches too, that a player's got to earn their way, that they shouldn't move up until they beat everyone at basically their level, their, their age, their division, their region. And it's like a stepping stone process, and it's very, uh, it's step by step uh, without too many leaps uh, up too high. And so that's sort of the, the, it's a gradual process of, of playing higher and higher level players, but you got to earn your way. And the other camp that I see a lot, especially with the, the parents who are hyper competitive and, and sometimes with my students who are looking to go on the pro tour is that they basically believe that faster progress is made by constantly challenging yourself against higher level players, no matter what. And these are, this is the divide that I see. I see it as a divided house in junior tennis. You have parents, coaches on the one hand who think that you don't get to play up or challenge up or train up unless you earn it unless you beat everyone around you and then you get to move to the next level and you have other parents and coaches and basically influencers in the game who believe that playing up in and of itself is what makes you better and you always need to challenge yourself with better and better players and so let's dig into those two stances those two approaches and talk about sort of the pros and cons and in my article i tried to list it that way And I'm not advocating one way or the other because I think this is a very complicated topic and it's very personal. You have to be very careful with your player 
and make the right decision for that individual. So this is one of those examples where I'm not trying to, I guess I am riding the fence a little bit, but I have to tell you my honest perspective. And that is that it really does depend. It depends on the kid. It depends on the situation. So, but I can try to help you make the best decision by going over the positives and the negatives. And in my article for New York Tennis Magazine, I talked about some of the positives for, for training up, uh, for, for earning your way up. And I'll, I'll kind of list them here for you. I have, I'm just using some of my notes from, from the essay. Number one positive. Hitting with stronger players regularly makes players stronger and girds them to handle pace and heavy spin. Players typically play better against players who are stronger. This is sort of the, the beginning of the argument for, for playing up without necessarily earning it. Stronger and older players usually don't hit as many moon balls or soft, disruptive shots. They hit harder drives, which some parents and children appreciate. Players find that they can get better rhythm with stronger, consistent players. It's often exhilarating and motivating to hit with stronger players. Players can pick up good habits just by being exposed to higher level players' skill levels, patterns, technique, and training intensity. So those are some of the positives with playing up without necessarily earning it, or just playing up in general. Here are a few negatives. Players don't develop their creativity as much when always playing higher level opponents in practice. There could be no time to experiment or work on deficits. It can be demoralizing and stressful to always lose in practice. Lack of success can hurt players' self-confidence. Some players get very nervous when playing higher level kids. They can build anxiety. They can develop a lot of anxiety by constantly playing up. Always playing with older players can be socially isolating for some players, especially if the player is quite young. There can be a negative social aspect with the young kid always associating with older players. For players who are not physically ready, playing up can increase the likelihood of musculoskeletal injury due to higher forces being applied to the ball, racket, and body. So that's one aspect in regards to playing up. Let me know if you have any questions or thoughts about that. And let me talk about competing up because in the article I tried to differentiate between playing up and competing up. Competing up would be in tournament play going to a higher division or a higher, a higher uh, maybe a different region where the players are stronger or moving up an age division or two age divisions. Some very talented kids will move up even two or three age divisions so you could have like a 12 year old playing in the 16s or 18s, you know, that's not uncommon, especially in girls tennis, girls junior tennis. So what are some of the advantages of competing up? I saw two here, and the first one was, or is, new and diverse competition can be found in higher divisions and in other regions around the country and the world. And that traveling to new and foreign places can be stimulating and also builds experience for the pro tour lifestyle. Those are common benefits of playing up. Negative aspects of playing up. The player is generally unable to experiment with new skills on the court because he is just trying to survive. Kind of relates to training up, same situation. The player can miss out on learning how to handle pressure because playing up tends to apply less pressure in competition. And we'll talk more about these as I as I finish reading them in just a bit. Traveling frequently can be a mental and emotional grind and can mentally fatigue a player over time. Traveling can eat up a lot of training time. Some coaches prefer a local tournament schedule to allow for more training in between events and after losses. And that's a common position of coaches who are not in favor of the ITF circuit. They often favor players stay local uh, so they can have a more efficient training week and not waste so much downtime in ITF, traveling to ITFs where typically there's, there's not a backdraw, 
and the players are not able to train as good as they could back home. So let's see what I got here with training, training up. Training up is a little different than competing up. Anyone who's listening to this who runs an academy or who works with groups, maybe high performance groups, coach, parent, who has experience trying to, trying to get kids together to practice together knows that it's always a really big challenge getting the leveling right. And there's going to be parents who demand that their kid play with higher level kids. And those are typically the parents who believe that no matter what their kid earns, they always want to constantly play up because it's part of their formula for success. They believe that that's what's going to make their kid great is the, the continual challenge of playing against stronger players or, or coaches for that matter or hitting partners. So there's that type of parent. And there are coaches also who believe that. But any coach that runs a group like a camp, you know, I run an academy, small, very small boutique academy. But even for me, small groups, uh, so, small summer camp, high performance summer camp, after school programs, any kind of academy situation where you have groups of players is this type of philosophy is very difficult to manage in an academy setting because in an academy, typically you need players to, to play a little bit up sometimes maybe with their peers sometimes, and a little bit down. So you try to get uh, a healthy mix. And that is a common refrain that you hear from coaches who run academies and groups. They, they advise parents, you know, I think it's healthier that your kid train with other kids their age, their level, and then sometimes challenge up, and then sometimes challenge down. That's a very common position. It's very sensible. It's very reasonable, but it really irks the type of the type of parent that I'm talking about, like the Richard Williams type, and any any phenom. Most phenoms, their their parents are usually espouse the opposite approach. The opposite approach is, as I mentioned, is is uh, well, they 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 always want to play up. Is what I was talking about before. They always want their kid to play someone better. And that makes it really impossible to run a program that way. Because imagine if you had 10 players and each parent demanded that their kid play with someone better. There would always be someone left out, you know. And no one would be satisfied because anytime you put a kid with, um, with someone who's lower than them, their parents are going to basically freak out and get really upset, maybe even pull their kid from the program. So I work with a lot of parents like that. It's very difficult. What, what happens usually, those types of parents who are on, on that end of the spectrum of playing up or training up, they, they usually get one-on-one -on -one hitting partners for their kids. And, you know, the Williams sisters did that a lot. You know, Capriati. All, all, you think of all the phenoms, you know, that, that are growing up. Uh, Celis, you know, you think of a lot of phenom girls, but I don't want you guys to think that's the only way to make it because I think that is kind of a myth. It, it's true that many, many phenoms develop that way. For example, imagine from the youngest age, never hitting with anyone your level, like constantly hitting with an older dude, like a college player, you know, all the time. Uh, I think that is, is uh, it's one way to do it. I don't think it's the only way to do it, all right? And as I mentioned, that can, be, that can be isolating sometimes for a kid. That can be stressful sometimes for a kid. If they're not wired a certain way, make sure a kid's wired a certain way because as I talked about in the article, that, that type of playing up for some kids creates a lot of anxiety. And... Also, a lot of coaches believe, and I, I, I believe too, that when you're always playing up like that, number one, you don't deal with as much pressure. So you're not faced with this. You're always playing someone who's better than you. So you, you're, you're expected to lose. So you never have to deal with uh, the pressure of playing someone who is below you. 
And because you never play someone who is below you, you also don't feel the liberty to experiment, to maybe work on your weaknesses, to develop an, uh, areas of your game that are maybe not your best, because you're always banging the ball with someone who's really strong. So to me, those are, you know, as I mentioned earlier, those are some of the drawbacks uh, of that approach, is you're, you're, you're playing up, you're playing a lot of strong players, it's fantastic because you get used to the pace and you get used to handling a big ball. And don't get me wrong, that's very, very important. But you also, there are some, some negatives. So that's why some of the best coaches uh, who, who I've studied with, for example, Jose Higueras is one of them who comes to mind, uh, the legendary Spanish coach. He was head of the USDA coaching the, uh, program. Uh, he, he was in charge of coaching for the USDA for many years. And he's, he was a, he's been a great mentor to me. I, I miss him a lot. I haven't seen him since the pandemic. And he's one of those guys who doesn't believe that. He, he has more of a, a balanced approach, uh, the kind of approach that I try to encourage my parents to embrace typically, where, it, yes, it's important to play up, but it's also you can get a very good practice playing someone your level. And you can get a... Uh, sometimes it can be a, a, a benefit to you to play someone who's a little bit below you, a little bit less than you in training. And I think it, it, the way Jose described it to me is he said, it's like your diet. You, you want to have a healthy nutrition. And if you're always eating the same food, it's not really good for your health. And I always like that analogy, that metaphor, Jose said that playing a variety of players, different skill levels, different types, is, is healthy. Essentially, the variety, variety is the spice of life. Variety is healthy for a player. And if you put in a great intensity to your workout, you can get a good practice, even with someone who's the same as you, and sometimes even someone who's a little bit less than you. And so you have the, this uh, paradigm where... It's a dichotomy. You have some people on one side, you have one camp, and then you have another camp. And there are positives and negatives. So for, for parents who insist on, on their player training up all the time, usually they don't, it doesn't work out so well in groups because groups, by definition, are trying to bring players together who are kind of similar UTR, maybe a little bit higher, a little bit lower. And the parents and, and kids too, who believe that they, they should pretty much 95% of the time play up, or maybe 100% of the time play up. I, I've worked with, for better or for worse, many parents who believe that. Um, sometimes their kids are really, really talented, and, and, and it works, that pathway works. I, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I think it, it, is a, it is a legitimate way to develop a champion. But it's not going to be great for any kind of group situation, and it's going to be hard for, to integrate that player into any kind of academy in any kind of meaningful way. So you hear stories of champions like Sellers who are training at an academy, you know, but they're not training with any of the kids. They're just training on their own court, with their dad and a coach and a hitter. And that's the kind of setup, if you see a dynamic like that, a setup like that, you know that's the philosophy of the parent. The parent doesn't believe it's beneficial to play anyone lower. And I don't want to say it's right or wrong, I just want to say that that doesn't really work for group training. That You just have to call, call a spade a spade, like see it for what it is. That that th there are some potentially negative aspects to that, like I said, social, emotionally, you gotta have a very strong, independent kid who doesn't wanna be around, doesn't need the social interaction of peers. That's number one, that's probably maybe the most import important requisite. You have to have a kid who's not injury prone, who can bang with bigger, stronger players, and there's not a high risk of injury. To me, that's another big, big danger with playing up. So some of the phenoms get away with it, but then some of the more average kids, their parents, they try to do the same. They try to do a, a Richard Williams, or they try to do a, a 
You know, they try to do a, a Sellers or a Capriati deal. And their kid gets hurt because their kid may not have the physical readiness to compete or train with big, much bigger and stronger players. Reminds me of in wrestling, my daughter is a wrestler, and in female wrestling, very important to train with, with men, but men who are not that big and powerful because they can really hurt your, your wrestler. And in tennis, it's very much the same thing. If you have a kid who's a little bit undersized or is going through puberty, going through a, a, a growth phase, you know, ligaments, tendons, uh, and their muscles are, 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 are going through a growth spurt, this is a very dangerous time to throw them in against really big, strong, powerful hitters, especially people serving at them, kicking the ball up. You know, that's where they get... Uh, there's a lot of, you can get a lot of ligament injuries that way. You can get, you, you can really hurt your player. You, have to, you can tendon injuries. You have to be very, very careful. So to me, I would just, if you want to take that road, if you want to do a Richard Williams deal, just please watch out for the social emotional aspect. Watch out for the, the stress on that player because that means the player is going to be losing pretty much all the time. It takes a certain type of kid to take loss after loss every day, just get knocked, basically, you know, get the crap knocked out of them. I, I won't use the, the S word, but, you know, like, like in boxing, like go into the ring and just get beat on every day. And then just to be like, all right, it, roll, it rolls off their shoulder, their shoulders, and they're back the next day ready for action again. Now, I love kids like that. They're absolute warriors. But let's face it, most kids are not really wired like that. And... If you have a kid who's wired like that, if you have a kid who's precocious physically, who can handle it, that is a legitimate pathway. I'm not saying it's wrong. In fact, I've worked with many families who they've done it that way, and their kids are tremendous players, became you know, champion players. I have uh, two little girls that I coach from Florida right now, Solomon Bali twins, amazing talents, these, these girls. They're twins, about 10 years old, Maybe the next Venus and Serena down there. And they come to train with me here. And their dad is amazing, amazing coach with them. He guides them very, very well. And they can play. I think he does it well. They, they sometimes play with their peers. But he's definitely smart and he wants them to play up a lot. Because he wants to challenge them. When you play stronger players, magically your kid starts to get much, much better. Because, guys, take it on the flip side. If you're training down, this is where things really get bad. So as a parent, you have to be on it. Because if a, if a group that you're going to, and you're, if your child is playing consistently with lower-level players, I think that's a recipe for disaster. And it's a recipe for inefficient development. You know, you, you're underachieving, basically. So watch out for that. Watch out for the flip side. But... Do they have to play 99% with players who are better, like that extreme? I think there's another more, you know, more balanced way, the Jose Higueras' way. Uh, Christian Anderko, big fan of the show, says, that is a tennis phenom there, but if your kid won't win a level three at age 24, why? She had to play up at 16. Right, you have to separate the phenoms. Thanks for the comment, Christia. You have to separate the phenoms sometimes from the average kids. Usually, the ki who are the kids who are playing up? Who are the kids who are training up? They're usually the talented ones, the really gifted kids. Unfortunately, some parents want to believe that their kids are really gifted, and they want to play them up like they see other kids who are phenoms doing. And that's usually a mistake that parents make. Every kid's on their own pathway, their own journey. So some kids are playing in the 16s at 12 or 18s at 12. And some kids are playing in this, their normal age division because every kid matures physically and emotionally, socially and emotionally at their own pace. So that's why I said at the beginning of the show, it's very important that you take this Approach based on the individual in front of you. You have to know your kid. Because if you play them up constantly, if you think that's the formula, but they're not socially and emotionally ready for that, or they're not physically ready for that, you're going to have a problem, right? And 
On the flip side, if you got a tough as nails, physically prepared kid who's 12, and they can play 16s or 18s, why hold them back? And it's a classic question. The greatest coaches in the history of the game debate this question. You know, Rick Macy having his students play in the 18s at 11, 12 years old, you know. Um, Macy's a great example. He, he has a lot of experience in this, for example. Robert Lansdorf. All the great junior developments have to make these decisions for their players, and the parents do. The, uh, the parents of the greatest phenoms of all time have to make these decisions too. And they have to, they have to sort of, through their intelligence and knowing their player and maybe experience, they have to do the right thing, make the right choice about when to hold a player back and when to push them ahead, right? Vanessa Rago has some comments. What's up, Vanessa? Vegas, baby. Uh, Vanessa's got some great superstars over there in Vegas who I coach. When you are 10 and want to play regular ball tournaments, you have no choice but to play up in the 12s. Yeah, and so there are other situations like Vanessa says. Uh, it, now with red, orange, green and, and different mandates by the USDA, sometimes parents are forced to play up. You know, so those are some uh, special situations where it may be warranted. I can tell you that in those age divisions, Vanessa, most of the, the really talented kids in my experience, they always play up one or two age divisions. I can tell you guys that the most talented phenoms that I've worked with, they're always playing up one or two age divisions. So that means they're not, they're not, they're, they're typically not in this, in their age group. So a 10 year old is usually playing in the 12s. A 10 year old, if they're really good, they might be playing in the 14s. You know, this is pretty common with phenoms, with kids who are very, very gifted. Now, when you have a kid who hasn't really proved it yet and their parents keep playing them up, let's talk about tournaments a little bit. Let's, let's switch gears because remember, as I wrote in the article, there's training up and I tried to differentiate that from playing up. So training up, if I could try to summarize for you guys, you have those, those two sides of the, of the uh, spectrum and what I'm suggesting is find the right way for your kid. And I think most kids will fit into a balanced way where they play up, they play some, some kids who are their peers, and then a little bit less of the time they play down to work on something, uh, to work on handling pressure. I think that, that's, not a, that's a healthy way to do it. And I used to think that you can't develop a champion that way. I'm not so sure anymore. I, I think you can do it. It's it's pretty healthy and balanced approach. And sometimes I say that the, the best players in the world don't develop in a balanced way, but I think it's possible. I, I, Jose tells me it's possible, and I want to believe in Jose, the legend from Spain, Jose Higueras. I want to believe in Jose. <laughs> He's probably out there chilling in Palm Springs right now. I miss, I miss Jose, but Jose, he, he, he's, he's, he says you can do it. And you know what? All the times I've been to USDA player development and Jose made the, you know, he, he made his, his players there, the top kids in the U.S. who were training there, he made them all play together, you know, against their peers. And every time I went there, you know, I go there on study trips down to Lake Nona and before, like in Boca. And it just, it, it really bothered me. I was like, you know, I, I never said it to Jose, but I was like, you know, Jose, probably your best girls, they shouldn't be training with each other. They should be training with some of the male coaches. And it also bothered me that the, the national coaches wouldn't hit with most of the, most of the national coaches didn't play in against the girls. Cause I was like, you know, that would be, and I, I was probably, I'm probably right about that. I was, I, cause I said to myself, that's probably, a, that would help their development if they played with more men, you know, played higher level players. Cause I, I believe in that. But, you know, they have a pretty good track record over there, especially with the women. You know, some of the women coming out of that, that program from a few years back, I'm thinking of like Jennifer Brady and a lot of the top girls. So many top girls came out of the USDA the last 10 years, uh, on the pro level. And that system worked for Jose. And the national coaches, they had, 
the the players mainly training with their same same sex so females were playing females and they practiced sometimes uh you know three you know two on one three to a court and it worked and a lot of those players evolved into top 100 players very impressive but maybe they're not superstar champions that's the question maybe they could have been a little bit better if they were more like like venus and serena you know playing with men all the time i don't know it's 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 hard to prove one way or the other but these are the kind of the questions that i have in my mind and, and i still you know it, it's it's a hot debate and you, you you see parents struggling with this question a lot coaches struggling with this question a lot uh in terms of competing up okay competing up here's where it gets a little dirty a little messy because we all know that there are there are parents now in junior tennis who will kind of chase points and tournaments they'll they'll break out the the wallet and start sending their kids all over the place you know to scrap uh, scrape scrape together points and it's kind of a it's kind of a devious way to push your kids ranking up it, it, it's sort of it's sort of un, it it's not really i don't like that approach very much let's put it that way so in that respect in competing you'd like to see the kid earn it right you'd like to see the kids showing some results before you start you know shelling out big bucks to travel to ITFs or or things like that but then you know you're always going to have the the other side of the debate where you know you're going to say well if i can get them to this other place they're going to play some different players you know they're going to um uh, it's going to be less stale and they're going to get more variety and they're going to grow from that so that's sort of the the flip side of the conversation but you know competing up i think is is uh it can get a little dicey if if you're just chasing points and you haven't earned anything like for example if a kid has not beaten everyone in their section should they really be doing a lot of nats or or doing a, uh, an itf uh, qualifying you know things like that i think you got to prove that you can get to a certain level now if you're five or let's say top 5 in your section and you're doing pretty well that means you're pretty much dominating you're dominating most of the players and you want to expand your competitive circle and and play more go out of your region and play more nationals and things like that i think that that is quite healthy i think some parents are, will play their kids up in age division they they don't finish out their age division so there's like 6 months left you see this very common now uh parents will will put their kid up to try to start earning points to to get some kind of a head start in the higher age division and you know I don't know about that it, 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 parents they, they say to me they you know all the other kids are doing that so I got to play up too I think sometimes I I like you know there are some some coaches that I've read um who who say no we're going to we're going to do the best we can in each age division and until we we dominate everyone in our age division we're not doing anything we're not going anywhere you got to prove yourself it's kind of a I don't want to say old fashioned but it's kind of a hard ass very strict approach like no you got to beat everyone every single player and then you can move up it's is very regimented and systematic and you know I respect that I think it's one way along the pathway again I I guess I try you know call me a, a fence rider but I try to find the the middle ground you know generally you should probably earn your way to nationals or internationals but sometimes you you if you if you have you have uh, proven yourself to a certain extent and you want to go get this exciting experience to go play a, a bigger tournament or uh, international tournament or a tournament with more variety of players players you haven't seen before maybe maybe that's okay you know but but the idea of just uh traveling and 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 bypassing your the local players who beat you regularly to go play somewhere else and earn points in a different circuit or at a different level i i think that's probably pretty flawed and i would i would caution parents if you if you get into that pattern uh at some point your kid really has to earn it and at some point your kid should learn how to win tournaments uh, that's another thing sometimes you see in in this sphere uh of discussion is players who will really never learn how to win a tournament 
I think I was listening to a podcast with J.J. Wolf's, probably his dad or maybe his coach. And, and I think that they took more of the approach that, I, that I'm talking about. Like you earn it, you earn everything, and you don't go up a level until you've beaten everyone. And I, I remember uh, either it was his dad or his coach talking about they took that one. J.J. Wolf's the top, um, top college player, for example. Uh, so you know that that these this is the different different perspectives, you know. Uh, I have, I have respect for parents and coaches who say that to a kid. They say, you know, you're not you're not going anywhere until you show me show me some results. And and there, I, I think some kids need to be brought down to earth that way, you know. And, and they and they need to you need to show them their record in their section and say, look. You haven't beaten 15 players in your section. You have, you don't have much of a business traveling to some fancy tournament. Just because your parents can't afford it doesn't mean you have the right to do that. Uh, you you got to maybe focus back home here and kick everyone's butt in your neighborhood before you start challenging people to fights from other cities, you know, other neighborhoods. So I think that's a very healthy message for kids. But with the, with the uh, you know, with the understanding that sometimes it can be motivating and uplifting, exciting, uh, builds enthusiasm if a kid uh, uh, from time to time goes and plays up somewhere, maybe where they're, they're a little bit outgunned, outclassed, but, but they understand that that's like for their experience, but they still have to prove it in, in, their, in their region primarily. You know, uh, I wanted to just mention before we wrap up here, that also, and if you have any, we have a nice little discussion going in the comments. If you have any uh, quick questions for me before I sign off, please let me know. But I think playing down and winning tournaments, learning how to really win a tournament, I think that's really a healthy thing. So it's, it's concerning to me when I have a young kid who, throughout junior career, never learned how to win a tournament. On the flip side, it's a little bit concerning to me when a kid is just always winning tournaments, like racking up the wins and maybe not getting enough challenge. So, you know, I can play this both ways, guys. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm like a, an economist here. You know, the famous joke about economists, economists always have two hands because they say, well, on the one hand, I, I see this in the market, and on the other hand, I see this. So I, I'm taking maybe the economist position here, but I think it's the intelligent position because it depends on the individual kid, depends on the situation. If you're, it, 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 you shouldn't have a kid going through the junior years who's never learned how to win five or six matches in a row, make it to finals day, when there's only two players left and learn how to win that match and get the trophy. Like that shouldn't happen, you know? And at the same time, if you're not providing adequate challenge for your player, they're just racking up trophies, but they're playing, you know, a bunch of scrubs, that's not gonna, that's not gonna help that player reach his or her full potential either. So it, it's a balancing act. Uh, let's see. Krista says, I like the approach of prove it first. Thank you, mi amigo. Vanessa, it's great that you tuned into the program. Thank you. Miss you guys. Let me know when you're back up in Vermont and we'll do some training. So that's kind of how I see it, guys. You've got, I tried to list off some of the positives and negatives of playing up and training up. Remember, there's kind of the two camps. One is the earn it position, the earn it approach. You got to earn it if you want to go up. The other is, well, I really need to play up as much as possible, re like relentlessly playing up, because that's going to make my player better. And I don't care if they're, 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 maybe they're, the win-loss ratio is a little bit low. Uh, it's not so good, because I just that's what I believe in. I believe that playing up, playing up, playing up is going to make my kids stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Beware of the pitfalls that I mentioned. Biggest negatives to watch out for. I mean, we talk, if, if you play uh, on both sides, there are negatives. But remember, watch out for injuries. Injury prevention, injury prevention. If you have a kid who's maybe not 
fully developed muscular, uh, muscularly, uh, physically, be careful because that kid may not be able to play up the way a precociously physically developed kid might be able to safely because uh, a big strong kid usually can play up higher level safe, more safely than a kid who's still very petite, skinny, not developed. And watch out for um, getting caught playing down too much. Like watch out in your training. Probably the biggest uh, growth killer, the biggest development killer in training is playing, is being in groups that are not challenging, with players who are not challenging. You know, that can be very demoralizing. That can, it can be, be just be a very uh, uh, energy draining environment for a kid. So watch out on, uh, for that pitfall as well. Watch out for the social emotional aspects. Remember, a kid might not be ready. They might be ready physically, but they might not be ready mentally and emotionally, socially to play. They might be good enough to play with 18 year olds. But maybe you don't want your 12-year-old playing with 18-year-olds every day. Maybe that's not the best, most healthy situation for them socially and emotionally. Maybe your kid wants to be with some peers when they're trained. Maybe it's better for them to play with some 13 and 14-year-olds, you know. So, you know, watch out for all these aspects and try to make the best decision. Most importantly for your kid... Be flexible. That's what I always tell parents. You can make a plan, make the best decision that you can, and then step, try to be objective and step back and analyze, okay, is this working? Is my player improving? Is my player's UTR rising? Are, am I, are we meeting the benchmarks? The, are, we, are we hitting the goals in our development plan? Is my player feeling positive, confident? Try to be objective about where your player's at. And if your player is, is, is lacking confidence, if your player is not performing well in tournaments, if your player is not meeting the benchmarks that you want, you may be taking the wrong approach. You may need to uh, adjust the way that you're training. Maybe that means playing up more, for example, or it means maybe playing up less. Maybe playing down a little or playing more peers. But, you know, remember, this is for training and for tournament play. And try to differentiate between both. Because sometimes you could maybe, uh, you could play up a lot in training and then sign up for a tournament where there's pressure and your player has to beat uh, players who are their peers or maybe a little bit lower. That would be a pressure-filled tournament as opposed to playing a tournament where you know, they're the worst person there and they're expected to lose first round. There's not as much pressure. there. For some kids, they might be stressed out by that, but th there's typically not as much pressure when you're playing someone who's, who's always in a tournament who's better than you. Uh, so, you know, keep, keep, uh, keep touch with all these aspects. I think it's a difficult, complex issue, and I don't think there's one way. Find the right way for your kid. And... Uh, Good luck trying to navigate this thorny uh, path because I think this is a very common question and it can, it, the answer, the correct formula is not fixed in stone, in concrete. And what works for your friend's kid or for this, or your, this other coach's kid, that may not be the right formula for your kid because they might be in different places mentally, emotionally, physically developmentally. So it has to be the right pathway for, for the individual. Uh, so I'm sorry that I can't give you a black and white answer, but I will play The Economist tonight. Guys, it was a wonderful show. I enjoyed sharing with you. I've got the new article coming out. Got some really cool news. My most recent book, The Secrets of Spanish Tennis, we just went into contract to publish the book in China. It's going to be picked up by a publisher there. I've been tasked with writing a new introduction for the book for the, for the Asian audience, and I'm, I'm super pumped. It's a big honor that the book will be distributed and marketed over in China, and I hope to share the Spanish way with all of the parents, coaches, and players over there. 
in, in Asia, they are big fans of the Spanish system. There are a number of Spanish academies who have started up programs in Asia. So this is very exciting for me. It means that I'm just glad that people appreciate the book. You know, The Secrets of Spanish Tennis was a lot of work. There was a lot of, re there was a lot of travel and research that I did in Spain to get to the, the culm that culminated in this book. And I'm quite proud of that. You know, sometimes I, I forget how many, how many years and travel trips that I went. And, you know, I, I brought my tape recorder and I took copious, prodigious amounts of notes. And, and eventually it culminated in uh, the book. And I, I believe that I am, I am an expert on the Spanish, different, all the different Spanish methods of training. So I'm, I'm really happy that the book is, is uh, going to go to a new audience now. And I just wanted to share that with you guys, all the fans of the show and the book. And things are really good. Uh, this pandemic is uh, just terrible. You know, I, I, it, I feel for everyone out there. Try to hang in there, guys. It's uh, tough, especially I can commiserate if you have a family, if you have kids. Very tough for parents right now. Very tough for me. Uh, we got the four kids at home. All the kids are homeschooling and just very stressful time. And uh, I'm just looking forward to uh, 2021. Hopefully we can put this pandemic behind us. But uh, uh, shout out to all you guys. Hang in there. Keep training hard. You know there's only one way to train. And that's like an animal. Got to train hard. Got to suffer the Spanish way. Uh, if you have any questions about playing up, should your kid play up? I'm always available to consult on email. You can message me, WhatsApp me. You can go. You can find me on socials online. You know how to reach me. And I, I enjoy helping parents from around the world make better decisions for their kids. So, guys, it was my pleasure. I'll see you on the next program. Adios, amigos.